the imitation of Christ. Book two, some advice on the inner life. The kingdom of God is within you, says our Lord. Turn to the Lord with all your heart and give up this worthless world. Then your soul will find rest. Learn indifference to all that lies outside you and devote yourself to the life within and you will see the kingdom of God coming in you. The kingdom of God means finding our peace and our joy in the Holy Spirit and the worldly cannot receive it. Christ will come to you and show you his comfort if you will prepare for him a worthy house in your heart. All his loveliness and his glory he keeps for the house of the soul and there it is that he takes his pleasure. Many of the times he comes to the man who lives the inward life and to him he grants sweet conversation, glad comfort, great peace and amazing friendship. O faithful soul, Prepare your heart for this bridegroom, so that he may be willing to come to you and dwell within you. For he says, If a man has any love for me, he will be true to my word, and we will both come to him and make our continual abode with him. Make room for Christ then, and deny entrance to all others. When you have Christ, you are rich and have all you require. He himself will faithfully provide for you, and supply you with everything, so that you have no need to look to men. Men soon change, and it is not long before they fail you, but Christ abides forever, and stands by you immovably, right to the end. Mortal men are weak, and so you should not rely on anyone, not even a good person, and one you're fond of. Nor should it cause you any great distress if people sometimes resist and contradict you. Those who are with you today and oppose you tomorrow, they swing right round like the wind. Rest your whole confidence on God, and let Him be your fear and your love. He will reply on your behalf, and in His wisdom do what is best for you. You have an everlasting city, but not here. Wherever you go, you are a stranger and an exile. Nor will you ever find rest, unless you are one with Christ in your heart. Why do you look round about you here, when this is not the place where you are meant to find your rest? Your home should be in heavenly places, and you should be looking on all earthly things as transient. All things pass away, and you are passing with them. Take care not to cling to them, or you may be entangled and perish. Let the Most High God take care of you, and see that your prayers are directed Christwards without ceasing. If you are not able to contemplate high and heavenly things, rest in the passion of Christ and be content to dwell within his sacred wounds. If you resort with devotion to the wounds and precious scars of Jesus, you will find great comfort in trouble. You will not mind so much if men despise you, and you will find it easy to bear when they speak against you. Christ, too, was despised by men in this world, and in his greatest need, was abandoned by friends and followers and left to face humiliation. Christ was prepared to suffer and to be despised. Dare you raise any complaint? Christ had enemies and detractors. Do you expect to find everyone a friend and benefactor? How can you be rewarded for endurance if you've never met anything that has to be endured? If you're not prepared to suffer opposition, how can you be the friend of Christ? You must endure with Christ and for the sake of Christ, if you wish to reign with Christ. If you had once entered completely into the heart of Jesus, and had tasted just a little of his burning love, then you would care nothing about your own convenience or inconvenience. Instead, you would rejoice when insult was offered you, for the love of Jesus makes a man unmindful of himself. A man who loves Jesus and the truth who is delivered from undisciplined desires and really lives the inward life,
can turn to God with nothing to hold him back. In spirit, he can rise beyond himself and rest in peace and joy. When a man can value all things as they really are and not as they're said or thought to be, then he's really wise and taught by God, not men. The man who knows how to walk the road of the inward life and set little store by things outside himself has no need of special places nor set times to perform his exercises of devotion. The man who's living the inward life can soon still all his thoughts because he never abandons himself entirely to outward things. No physical toil is any obstacle to him nor any activity that must be performed. He can adjust himself to anything that comes. The man whose inner life is well-ordered and disciplined does not care about men's perverse, strange ways. For a man is only hindered and distracted from God insofar as he involves himself in what goes on around him. If you were in a good state and thoroughly purified, everything would help to secure your good and contribute to your progress. The reason why you're so often angry and upset is because you're not yet completely dead to your own interests and separated from all that is earthly. There is nothing that pollutes and entangles the human heart so much as an unpurged love for things that have been created. Only if you refuse outward comforts will you be able to glimpse the things of heaven and often know the inward joy. On submitting humbly. You are not to mind greatly who is for you or against you, but take good care that God is with you in everything you do. Make sure you have a good conscience and God will watch over you. And if God is prepared to support a man, no one else's unpleasantness can hurt him. If you know how to suffer in silence, you will undoubtedly find the Lord delivering you. He knows the time and the method by which he will save you, and so you should leave yourself to him. It's God's nature to help and to rescue from humiliation of every kind. It's often a great help to us in maintaining our humility if others are aware of our failings and point them out. If a man humbles himself when he's done wrong, he soon wins others over and appeases those who are angry with him. It is the humble man whom God protects and delivers, the humble whom he loves and comforts. It's to the humble that he turns a willing ear and grants his grace in abundance. And after he has been downtrodden, he lifts him up to glory. It is to the humble that he reveals his secrets and he lovingly draws him and calls him to him. If a humble man is humiliated, his peace is not disturbed because he does not live by the world. His life depends on God. Only when you think yourself of less importance than everybody else may you consider that you have made some progress on the good man who spreads peace. Live in peace yourself and then you can bring peace to others. A peaceable man does more good than a learned one. A man who is prey to strong emotions turns even what is good to evil and is ready to believe evil, whereas the good peaceable man turns everything to good. A man who lives in peace does not suspect anyone, but a discontented, unsettled man is tormented by all kinds of suspicions. He is not quiet himself, and he does not allow others to be quiet. He often says what he should not, and neglects to do what he should. He is aware of others' obligations, but fails to observe his own. Turn your indignation on yourself in the first place. Then you can, with some justice, turn it on your neighbor. You're skilled in finding excuses and putting a good complexion on your own actions, and yet you're unwilling to listen to the excuses of others. It would be more reasonable to accuse yourself and excuse your brother. If you want others to bear with you, you must bear with others. See how far you are still from the true love and humility that does not know how to be angry or offended with anyone except itself. It is no great achievement to be able to live with good, gentle people. Everyone naturally finds that a pleasant thing. Every one of us likes to have an easy life and prefers people that agree with him. 
but to be able to live with unresponsive, unpleasant or undisciplined people is a sign of great grace. It deserves praise and is a deed nobly done. There are some people who live in peace themselves and are also at peace with others. There are some who neither enjoy peace in their own lives nor leave others in peace. They are a burden to other people and even more of a burden to themselves. There are others who not only keep themselves in peace but are always ready to guide others back to peace. Yet in this wretched life of ours, peace must depend not on freedom from distress but on the ability to submit to suffering humbly. It's the man who knows best how to endure who will preserve the deepest peace. It is this sort of man that overcomes himself and is master of the world, that is the friend of Christ and the heir of heaven. On a pure heart and a sincere purpose. There are two wings on which man soars away from earthly things, single-mindedness and purity. Single-mindedness shows itself in what we purpose, purity in what we feel. It's by single-mindedness that we reach towards God, by purity that we grasp Him and taste His sweetness. You will not find anything to hinder you in good actions when your heart is once freed from uncontrolled desires. If you intend and desire nothing but the will of God and your neighbor's good, you will know that inner freedom. If your heart were right, then every created thing would be a mirror of life and a book of holy doctrine. For no creature is so small and mean that it cannot display God's goodness. If your heart were good and pure, there would be nothing to prevent you from looking at everything and really understanding it. For a pure heart can penetrate heaven and hell. A man's impressions of the world depend on what he is in his heart. If there's joy in the world, the man whose heart is pure will certainly possess it. If there's trouble and distress anywhere, the bad conscience is the one more likely to feel it. When iron is put in the furnace, it loses its rust and becomes white hot through and through. In the same way, a man who turns wholeheartedly to God is stripped of his spiritual lethargy and is transformed into a new person. When a man's enthusiasm cools, he shrinks from small tasks and is ready to let in comfort from outside. But when he really begins to overcome himself and walk boldly in the way of God, then he hardly troubles about things which he found so burdensome before. On turning our eyes on ourselves. We cannot rely on our own judgment, because we often lack both grace and discernment. The light within us is small, and we soon lose even that through carelessness. Besides, we often do not realize how blind we are in our hearts. We behave badly, and worse still, excuse what we have done. We feel anger, and call it righteous indignation. We censure small faults in others, and pass over worse ones in ourselves. We are quick enough to sense and brood over what we have to bear from others, but we do not notice how much they have to bear from us. Anyone who considers his own life with thoroughness and honesty has no reason to judge another harshly. The man who lives the inward life puts the care of his own soul before all other cares. The man who's really concentrating on himself finds it easy to be silent where others are concerned. You will never achieve inwardness and devotion unless you avoid remarking on other people's business and keep your thoughts for yourself. If you're really concentrating on yourself and God, anything that you observe outside will make little impression on you. Where are you when your thoughts go wandering off? You've ranged over everything, but have you made any progress while you neglected yourself? If you're to have peace and real union, you must put all this aside and have nothing before your eyes but your own inner life. Your progress depends on keeping yourself free from commitment to any temporal concern. If you let your thoughts dwell on anything that belongs to the world, you will fall far short of the goal. You should find nothing great or wonderful or lovely or pleasurable except God only and what comes from Him. 
Any comfort you meet from created objects, consider utterly worthless. For a soul that truly loves God disregards all else as it all falls short of him. It is God, the eternal, the immeasurable, the filler of all things, who alone can solace the soul and bring true joy to the heart. On the Gladness of a Good Conscience The glory of a good man is the witness of a good conscience. Have a good conscience and you will always have gladness. For a good conscience is able to endure a great deal and be glad even in adversity, whereas a bad conscience is always fearful and restless. You will enjoy quiet rest if conscience does not condemn you. Only when you have done well should you feel glad. The wicked never have true happiness and do not know peace in their hearts, because for the rebellious, the Lord says, there is no peace. Do not believe them if they say, look how prosperous we are, how can harm befall us, who will dare attack us? God's anger will suddenly rise up against them, what they've done will be utterly destroyed, and all their designs come to nothing. It is not hard for the lover of Christ to glory even over afflictions, and this kind of glorying is glorying in the cross of the Lord. The glory that men give and receive never lasts for long, for the glorying of this world is always linked with sorrow. The glory of good men lies in their conscience, not in what people say of them. The gladness of the upright comes from God and depends on Him. Their joy comes from the truth. A man who desires the true, eternal glory has no interest in the glory of this world, but anyone who looks for this world's glory and in his secret heart does not despise it is shown to have but little love for the heavenly glory. A man who cares nothing for praise or blame knows great inward peace, and it's easy for the man whose conscience is clean to find contentment and quiet. Praise does not make you holier than you are, nor blame more wicked. You are exactly what you are. You cannot be said to be any better than you are in the eyes of God. If you are attending to what you really are within you, you will not care what men are saying of you. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Man weighs actions, but God probes intentions. If a man always does well and yet sets no great store by himself, it is a sign that his heart is humble. If he has no desire to find comfort in any created thing, it's a sign of great purity and of inward confidence. If he feels no need of men's support and assurance, it is clear that he has committed himself entirely to God. For as the blessed Paul says, it is the man whom God accredits, not the man who takes credit to himself, that proves himself to be true metal. It is the mark of the inward living man to break all ties of affection with the outside world and to walk with God in his heart. On loving Jesus above all things. If a man knows what it is to love Jesus and to disregard himself for the sake of Jesus, then he is really blessed. We have to abandon all we love for the one we love, for Jesus wants us to love him only above all other things. The love of creatures is fickle and unreliable, but the love of Jesus is trustworthy and enduring. The man who clings to created things will fall with them when they fall, but a man who embraces Jesus will be upheld forever. It is Jesus whom you must love and keep to be your friend. When all else fades away, he will not leave you, nor let you perish at the end. Whether you will or no, you must one day leave everything behind. Keep yourself close to Jesus in life as well as death. Commit yourself to his faithfulness, for he only can help you when everything else will fail. Your beloved is not one to let a rival in. He wants to have your heart to himself and to rule there like a king on the throne that is his right. If you knew how to empty your house of created things, then Jesus would be glad to dwell with you. Anything you give to the world and not to Jesus 
you will find almost a total loss. Do not lean on the reed that bends with the wind, and do not trust it. All mortal things are like grass, and all their glory like the bloom of grass that falls. If you only look at the outward appearance of men, you will soon be disappointed. For if you expect other people to bring you comfort and advantage, you are more likely to meet with loss. If you look for Jesus in everything, it will be Jesus that you find. If you look for yourself, you will find yourself, and it will lead to your destruction. A man who fails to look for Jesus does himself more harm than the whole world and all his enemies can. On Close Friendship with Jesus When Jesus is with us, all is well, and nothing seems difficult. But when Jesus is not with us, everything is hard. When Jesus is not speaking in our hearts, comfort means nothing. But if Jesus speaks just one word, we experience abundant comfort. Remember how Mary Magdalene rose at once from the place where she sat weeping, when Martha said to her, The Master is here and bids thee come. It's a blessed moment when Jesus calls us from tears to the joy of the Spirit. How unmoved and hard you are without Jesus. How foolish and empty if you desire anything but Him. Surely this is a greater loss than the loss of the whole world. What can the world give you without Jesus? To be without Jesus is a bitter hell, but to be with him is sweet paradise. If Jesus is with you, no enemy can harm you. The man who finds Jesus finds a wonderful treasure, a treasure beyond all other treasure. The man who loses Jesus loses a great possession, greater than all the world. The man who lives without Jesus is in direst poverty, but the man who is close to Jesus has abundant riches. It's a great art to know how to keep company with Jesus, and great wisdom to know how to hold him. If you are humble and peaceable, Jesus will be with you. Be devout and quiet, and Jesus will stay with you. It's easy to drive Jesus away and lose his grace if you turn away from him to outward things. And if you drive him away and lose him, whom will you turn to then? Whom will you choose to be your friend? You cannot live happily without a friend, and if Jesus is not your friend beyond all others, you will find yourself very sad and lonely. You're a fool if you find your confidence and joy in any other. You must choose to have the whole world against you, rather than Jesus offended at you. Of all you hold dear, let Jesus only be your especial love. You must love all people for the sake of Jesus, but you must love Jesus for himself. And Jesus Christ is the only person who may be loved beyond all others, for he alone is good and faithful beyond all other friends. For Jesus' sake and in Jesus, you must value enemies as well as friends, and you must pray to him for all of them, so that all may learn to know and love him. You must never desire any unique love or praise for yourself, for that belongs to God alone, who has no other like him. You must never wish to be the center of anyone else's thoughts, nor should you let your own thoughts and affections be centered on someone else. Jesus must be in you and in every good man. See that you are inwardly free and purified, unattached to any created thing. You must be stripped of everything and must bring to God a heart that is pure if you wish to be free and see how gracious the Lord is. And you will certainly not be able to do this unless His grace goes before and leads you on, enabling you to dismiss all others and send them right away, and then, when you are left alone, be joined to God alone. For when the grace of God comes to a man, he finds himself able to do all things, but when it leaves him, he is poor and weak, and abandoned to the lash of misery. At such times, he must not give way to depression or despair, but wait calmly for the will of God, 
and bear all that happens to him so that Jesus Christ is praised. For after winter comes summer, after night comes day, after the storm great calm. On doing without comfort. It is not difficult to despise the comfort that comes from men when we have comfort from God. But it is a very great thing to bear the absence not only of human comfort but of God's as well. It is a great thing if to do God honor we are willing for our hearts to suffer exile, if we are prepared not to seek our own satisfaction in anything nor to think about what we have earned. Is there anything remarkable in feeling joy and devotion when grace comes to you? Everyone longs for such a moment. A man who is borne along by the grace of God rides pleasantly enough, and it's no wonder if he feels no burden when he's carried by the Almighty and led by the great guide. We like to have something to comfort us, and man finds it hard to throw off his natural self. Yet the holy martyr Lawrence overcame the world together with his priest, since he paid no attention to what seemed delightful in this life, and for love of Christ, quietly accepted the loss of Zixus, God's high priest, whom he loved very much. In this way, he overcame love of man by love of the Creator, and instead of the comfort he had in man, he preferred the will of God. You too must learn to leave a dear and beloved friend for the love of God, and not resent it, when your friend leaves you, but remember that all of us must one day be parted from one another. There's a long, hard struggle in the heart of man before he learns to overcome himself completely and transfer all his affections to God. When a man depends on himself, it's easy for him to fall away to human comfort. But the man who really loves Christ and earnestly strives towards virtue does not fall back on such comforts. He does not desire the pleasant sensations that this life affords, but prefers strict exercises and enduring hard toil for Christ. When the comfort of the Spirit is given you from God, receive it with thanks, but realize that it's a gift from God, not something you deserve. Do not feel pride or excessive joy or empty presumption, but feel more humble at the gift, and be more cautious and guarded in all you do because this hour will pass and temptation will follow. When comfort is taken away from you, do not immediately fall into despair, but humbly and patiently wait for the merciful gift of heaven, for God is able to restore your comfort, giving you more than before. This is nothing new or strange to those who have experienced the way of God, for the great saints and the prophets of long ago often knew this sort of alteration. So in the Psalms we find the psalmist saying of the time when grace was with him, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. But then grace was withdrawn, and he tells us what he suffered. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was dismayed. Yet he did not despair, but prayed to the Lord more urgently, and said, To thee, Lord, I cried, to the Lord I made supplication. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be thou my helper. At last he received the reward of his prayer, and he proclaims that God had heard him, and tells how he replied. Thou didst turn my sadness into rejoicing. Thou hast girded me about with gladness. If God dealt like this with the great saints, we who are weak and poor must not despair if sometimes we find fervor and sometimes we are cold. For the Spirit comes and goes according to his own good pleasure. As the blessed Job says, Thou dost visit him every morning and test him every moment. So I cannot rest my hopes or put my trust in anything except the great mercy of God and the hope of heavenly grace. Even if I have around me good men, devout brethren, faithful friends, holy books, fine treatises, sweet chants and hymns, all of these are of little help and give little pleasure when I am abandoned by grace and left to my own poverty. Then there is no better remedy than patience and self-denial in the will of God. 
I have never found anyone so religious and devout that he did not sometimes feel grace withdrawn and his fervor lessened. There has never been any saint so caught up to heaven and illumined that he was not tempted either before or after. For no man is worthy of the sublime contemplation of God unless for God's sake he has been exercised by some trial. Temptation is often a sign of comfort to come, for it's to those who have been tried in temptation that the comfort of heaven is promised. To him who conquers, we read, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. On the other hand, the divine comfort is given to a man to make him stronger to bear adversity, and it will be followed by temptation, so that the good gift does not make him proud. The devil does not go to sleep, and the old nature is not yet dead. Therefore, you must not cease to prepare yourself for battle, for an enemy who never rests surrounds you to right and to left. On Gratitude for the Grace of God Why do you expect rest when you are born for toil? Prepare yourself for hardship, not for happiness, for bearing the cross, not for being glad. Even worldly people would be glad to receive comfort and spiritual joy if they could keep them always, for the comforts of the spirit surpass all the delights of the world and the pleasures of the body. All the delights of this world are unsatisfactory or shameful, but the delights of the spirit alone are lovely and good. They are born of virtues and are poured by God into hearts that are pure. But no man is able to enjoy the comfort that comes from God all the time, and as he pleases, because the time of temptation never comes to an end. What does hinder the merciful gift from heaven is overconfidence and false liberty of mind. God does well in giving us the grace of comfort, but man does ill in not giving it all back to him with thanks. The gifts of grace cannot flow in our hearts because we are ungrateful to the giver and do not pour them back into the fount from which they came. For grace can only be given to the man who has grace to give thanks, and the gift which is given to the humble will be taken from the proud. I would rather not have comfort if it takes away compunction, nor have I any desire for contemplation if it leads to pride. Not everything that is high is holy, nor is everything that is pleasant good. Not every desire we have is pure, nor is all that we hold dear acceptable to God. The grace I am glad to receive is one which makes me more humble and careful, more ready to renounce myself. Grace is given to a man to teach him, and is taken away to train him. And anyone who has experienced this will not venture to attribute any good thing to himself, but will acknowledge his poverty and nakedness instead. Give to God what is God's, and assign to yourself what is yours, that is, attribute all grace to God with thanks, and take to yourself all the guilt, acknowledging that there is a penalty that should be paid for your guilt. Put yourself always in the lowest place, and you will be given the highest. Without the lowest, the highest cannot exist. The greatest saints in the sight of God are the least in their own eyes. The more glorious they are, the greater the humility they feel. Full of truth and heavenly glory, they have no desire for groundless glorying. They are founded and fixed in God, and cannot be shaken by pride. They ascribe to God whatever good they have received, and are not ambitious for honor from one another, but desire the honor that comes from him who alone is God. Their aim is the praise of God above all things in themselves and in all the saints, and they are always seeking this end. Show yourself grateful, therefore, for the smallest gift, and you will be worthy of receiving greater ones. Let the smallest be in your eyes equivalent to the greatest, and an insignificant gift the equal of a special favor. If you consider the rank of the giver, nothing that he gives will then seem small or worthless, for no gift can be small that comes from the Most High God. Even if he gives punishment and scourging, we should accept it with gladness, for anything he allows to happen to us, he does for our salvation always. 
A man who wishes to retain the grace of God must show thankfulness when it's given him and patience if it's taken away. He should pray for its return and then be careful and humble so as not to lose it. On the fewness of those who love the cross of Jesus. Jesus has in these days many people who love his heavenly kingdom but few who bear his cross. He has many who desire comfort, but few who are ready for trials. He has found many to share his table, but few to share his fast. Everyone longs to rejoice with him, but few are ready to suffer for him. Many follow Jesus as far as the breaking of the bread, but few go so far as to drink the cup of his passion. Many glory in his miracles, few follow him in the shame of the cross. Many people love Jesus as long as misfortune does not fall on them. They praise him and bless him as long as they are receiving any comfort from him. But if Jesus hides himself or leaves them for a while, they complain bitterly or fall into great despair. Yet those who love Jesus for his own sake and not for any comfort they can get from him, bless him in every trial and distress of heart, just as they do amidst the richest spiritual comfort. Even if he were never prepared to grant them comfort, they would still be always praising him and always wanting to offer him thanks. What power there is in pure love for Jesus, unmixed with any self-seeking or thought of personal gain. Surely, mercenary, is the right name for the people who are always looking for spiritual comforts. And those who are always thinking about their own profit and advantage quite clearly love themselves, not Christ. Where will you find a man who is prepared to serve God for nothing? It's not often one finds anyone so spiritual that he's stripped of everything. Who can find a man who is really poor in spirit, emptied of every created thing? Such a man, to quote scripture, is a rare treasure brought from distant shores. If a man gives up all that he has in the world, it's still nothing. If he does great penance, it's still a small thing. If he attains all knowledge, it still falls short. If he has great virtue and burning devotion, he still lacks much, the one thing in fact which he needs most of all, and that is to renounce everything, and then to renounce himself, to leave self entirely behind and have no vestige left of love for self. Then, when he's done everything which he knows he should do, he must realize he's done nothing. If he has done anything worthwhile, he must think nothing of it, but honestly declare himself a worthless servant. As he who is the truth says, when you've done all that was commanded you, you are to say, we're servants and worthless then that man will be really poor and naked in spirit and will be able to say with a prophet, I am friendless and forlorn. Yet the man who knows how to renounce himself and all things and put himself in the lowest place has more riches, power and freedom than anyone. On the Royal Way of the Holy Cross Renounce self, take up your cross, follow Jesus. These words seem very hard, yet it will be much harder to hear those final words. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. The people who now gladly hear and obey the words which bring them the cross will have no fear then of the words that mean eternal condemnation. When the Lord comes to judge, it will be this sign of the cross that is in the heaven. Then all the servants of the cross, who in this life followed in the steps of the crucified Jesus, will come before Christ the Judge with confidence and boldness. So why are you afraid to take up the cross when it leads us to the kingdom? In the cross is salvation. In the cross is life. In the cross is defense from enemies. In the cross, heaven's sweetness is outpoured. In the cross is strength of mind. In the cross is joy of spirit. In the cross is highest virtue. In the cross is perfect holiness. There is no salvation for the soul, nor hope of eternal life 
except in the cross. Take up your cross then and follow Jesus and you will enter eternal life. He went before you carrying his cross and on the cross he died for you so that you too should carry your cross and long for a death on the cross. For if you share his death, you will also share his life. If you're with him in his suffering, you will be with him in his glory. All that matters is the cross and dying on that cross. There's no other way to life and real inward peace except the way of the Holy Cross and of daily dying to self. Go where you like, look for what you like. You will not find a higher way above or a safer way below than the way of the Holy Cross. Even if you arrange everything to suit your own views and wishes, you will always find that you still have to suffer something, whether you want to or not. The cross will always be there. If you do not suffer physical pain, you will have inward trials of the Spirit. Sometimes God will abandon you. Sometimes your neighbor gives you something to bear. And worse still, you will often be a burden to yourself. No remedy or comfort will be able to deliver or relieve you, but you will have to bear it as long as God wills it so. For it is God's will for you to learn to endure troubles without receiving comfort, so that you will submit entirely to Him, and from this trouble learn humility. No one feels the passion of Christ in his heart as much as the man whose lot it is to suffer as he did. So the cross is always close by and waits for you everywhere. You cannot escape it, wherever you may run. For everywhere you go you take yourself, and always you will find yourself. Look up or down, out or in, there too you will find the cross. And all the time you must go on being patient if you wish to have inward peace and to win a crown that will last forever. If you carry your cross with gladness, it will carry you and lead you to that longed-for goal where there will be no more suffering, though there will always be suffering here. If you carry it grudgingly, you will make it a burden and weigh yourself down, but all the same, you will have to bear it. If you throw one cross aside, you will certainly find another, and possibly one that is heavier to bear. Do you think you can escape what no man on earth has been able to avoid? Did any one of the saints escape a cross and a trial while he was in this world? Not even Jesus Christ our Lord was free from the pain of his passion for one hour while he lived. It was fitting, he said, that Christ should suffer and rise from the dead and enter so into his glory. How can you look for some other way than this royal way, which is the way of the Holy Cross? The whole life of Christ was a cross and a martyrdom. Do you expect peace and joy? You go very, very wrong if you expect to do anything but endure troubles. For all this life that we live as mortal creatures is full of sorrows and marked everywhere with crosses. And it often happens that a man finds even heavier crosses as he makes spiritual progress and begins to rise because his growing love makes his exile harder to bear. Yet the man who suffers all these afflictions is not without the relief of comfort, because he realizes that from bearing his cross, great profit comes to him. As long as he submits to it willingly, all the burden of his suffering is transformed into the assurance of comfort coming from God. The more his body is reduced by suffering, the more his spirit is strengthened by inward grace. His desire to be molded to the cross of Christ makes him long for trials and difficulties. And he finds such strength in this that he would not want to be delivered from his sorrow and distress if he could, since he believes that as he bears more and heavier burdens for God's sake, so he becomes more acceptable to him. This desire is not due to any human virtue, but to the grace of Christ, which works so powerfully in man's weak body that through the burning passion of the Spirit he comes to love and strive for the very things that naturally it hates and avoids. It's not natural for a man to carry the cross and to love the cross, to buffet his body and make it his slave, to avoid honors and to bear insults gladly, to show no regard for himself and to respect none from others, 
to suffer all kinds of adversity and loss and to have no wish for this world's prosperity. If you rely on yourself, you will find you have no power to do any of this. But if you trust in the Lord, strength will be given you from heaven and the world and your natural self will be put under your control. You will not even fear our enemy the devil if you are armed with faith and signed with the cross of Christ. Make yourself ready then, like a good, faithful servant of Christ, manfully to carry the cross of your Lord, who was crucified for love of you. Prepare yourself to bear a great deal of adversity and all kinds of discomfort in this unhappy life, because it will be the same wherever you are, and you will find it so wherever you hide yourself. It is right for you to be like this, and there is no way of escaping sorrow and the trouble that evil brings, you have to endure what human nature involves. Drink the cup of the Lord with love if you want to be his friend and have any share with him. Leave the question of spiritual comfort to God. Let him do as he wills with it. Make up your mind to bear your troubles. Consider them, in fact, the greatest comforts. For even if you alone could undergo every suffering there is, these present sufferings, as St. Paul says, are not to be counted as the measure of their glory nor are they enough to win it. When you reach a state in which troubles become sweet and satisfying to you for Christ's sake, then you may think that all is well with you, because you found paradise on earth. As long as you find suffering a burden and try to escape it, things will go badly with you, and you will always be running away from trouble. But if you once accept that suffering and the killing of the old nature are what you have to face, your state will soon improve and you will know peace. Even if you are carried up to the third heaven with Paul, that will not mean you are secured from all adversity. I have yet to tell him, says Jesus, how much suffering he will have to undergo for my name's sake. So suffering lies ahead of you, if it's your wish to love Jesus and serve him continually. If only you were really worthy of suffering something for the name of Jesus, what glory would be waiting for you? How all the saints of God would rejoice. How those around you would be strengthened. For everyone praises endurance, but few are prepared to endure. You might with good reason accept a little suffering for Christ, when many people endure worse things for the sake of the world. You can be certain that the life you must lead is a dying life, and that a man begins to live before God only as he dies to his own nature. No one is fitted to understand heavenly things unless he submits to bearing adversity for Christ's sake. Nothing is more acceptable to God or more healthful for you in this world than willing suffering for Christ. If the choice were yours, you should choose suffering and adversity for the sake of Christ rather than comforts and spiritual refreshment. Then you would be more like Christ and closer to all the saints. Merit and progress in our calling are not found in delights and comforts, but in bearing great burdens and troubles. If there had been anything that advanced man's salvation more than suffering, Christ would certainly have shown it by word and deed. For he clearly impresses on the disciples who are following him, and on all those thinking of following him, the need to carry the cross. For he says, If any man has a mind to come my way, let him renounce self, and take up his cross and follow me. So when we have read and examined everything, this must be our final conclusion. We cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without many trials. The end of the second book.